the other interesting thing uh, about light microscopes about uh, microscopy also that uh, really came up from the fact that um, uh, the with from the idea that you know you are able to hit uh, something uh, that is fluorescent um, you know in uh, a cell um, or put something in cells that is fluorescent and hit it with light um, and then measure the fluorescence uh, energy that is emitted Right. So instead of just looking at what's there, you're looking at the fluorescence that is coming out from a very specific, um, you know, region of the cell or a specifically labeled, uh, in some case, protein inside the cell uh, or an organelle inside the cell. Right. And, and that is determined by the fact that there is uh, something that is fluorescent, which will absorb light at a certain wavelength and emit light at a different wavelength. And so you hit the cell um, or whatever it is that you want to observe with a light at a wavelength that will allow you to activate the fluorescence of this object. And then you record the light that this is emitting to now be able to see you know, this particular object um, and not everything else. right? And this allows you to be able to tag and detect very specific things right, inside the cell. Fluorescence microscopy has really transformed uh, you know, how we view and think about um, cells. As I said, these are the different kinds of objectives. And as you can see, each microscope has a certain magnification. It will have a certain numerical aperture um, and, and they together determine, right, what exactly uh, is um, the efficiency with which you can see, you can see stuff through this. Uh, now, there are objectives which are just air objectives, you know, where, um, you know, the numerical aperture uh, that can be used to uh, see anything using that objective um, is largely determined by the fact that there is air between the uh, objective and the sample, right? In some cases, that are there are water objectives, which means, you know, you can have a small layer of water between the objective and the sample, and that now changes the numerical aperture in such a way that there is just enough light to be able to see stuff uh, that you would not uh, with, say, just an air objective. Um, and then you have oil immersion objectives, right? And one of the common mistakes here is that you need to know which objective is oil and which objective is air uh, and which objective is water. Um, they are not interchangeable, right? So you can't take an air objective and put oil in it and think that you're now going to be able to see things better. You will not, right? So the objective also is designed in such a way that, uh, you know, this, um, you know, adding or presence of oil or water could affect the way light enters it, right? So the objective along with uh, what you use to regulate the numerical aperture can determine, uh, you know, how visualization happens. Um, as I said earlier, there are fluorophores which are fluorescent and can now, um, you know, look at, uh, allow you to see things inside the cell. There are many different dyes, uh, you know, so they could be just chemical compounds. There are proteins like the green fluorescent protein, right, that you may hear more about in the future as well, um, which is can be used to tag a protein. So you can take a protein and you can add this tag to it, you know, and um, this can be done by cloning, uh, you know, taking the DNA of the protein that is of interest, taking the DNA of uh, the green fluorescent protein, adding it side by side. And, and you guys now learned about translation and you translate the entire protein. Right. And so you have the protein now with a fluorescent tag. It's like adding a bulb to the protein. Right. And this bulb will glow uh, the moment light of a particular wavelength hits it. Um, and when it when I say it glows, that means it is emitting light in a particular wavelength. Right. And so so that, um, uh, you know, allows you to now see things. You know these molecules in such a way that you would not be able to otherwise, right? Um, and so this can be used to look at different aspects of how um, you know cells um, or different things inside the cells, right? Um, the other really major advance, um, you know, so you had the conventional microscopy, you had uh, you know the ability to now use these objectives to see cells in such a way that you could not before. Um, you had fluorescence microscopy, uh, you know, where you could tag certain things with a fluorophore and now look at that fluorophore inside the cell, 
uh, or that fluorescent molecule inside the cell rather than just the cell. Um, the other real major advance that happened with microscopy is something called confocal microscopy. Okay, and confocal microscopy is, is conceptually, I wanted you to quickly understand what confocal microscopy does that is different, right? And what it does different is very beautifully illustrated here, right? Now, um, if you have um, an object and it has many different layers in it, right? Because it's, a, it's an object that's a three-dimensional object. Even if it's a cell, even if it is very small, it has, uh, you know, a certain depth to it, uh, right? And when you visualize something, and imagine you're visualizing, um, you know, something that's a stack of uh, things like this, right? A bunch of balls that are sitting on the surface. Um, and when you use the objective to focus, you're focusing actually uh, on a very small area, right? So the depth of focus that you see here uh, is where you're focusing uh, on, right? Uh, but the depth of light collection, which is, you know, from where light is collected into the objective, uh, is not just in the depth of focus, it's from above and below as well, right? So when you look at an object that looks, uh, you know, with that kind of uh, depth of uh, light collection, what you see is that not only can you see that particular plane, right, but you can see be diffused, right, light that is coming from above and below, right. That essentially means, uh, you know, your image that is in that particular plane of focus uh, is kind of altered or is made fuzzy by the fact that you are collecting light from above and below as well, right. Um, what a confocal microscope does, which is quite remarkable, is interesting, is that it will allow you to uh, visualize at a particular plane, right? But more interestingly, it will activate or shine light, okay, only in that particular plane, and it will also collect light from only that particular plane, right? So, so that means an object that looks like this, now if the depth of light collection is also restricted, you can see that um, you know your object has the uh, what you're seeing has been dramatically clarified because you know light coming from above or below is no longer collected okay so so this makes visualization really interesting and really clear in in ways that would not be possible otherwise i i'm not going to get into uh, you know these uh, aspects. What I wanted you to uh, look at is also this other interesting aspect of a confocal microscope, which is the because of the fact that you are able to collect light from uh, one particular plane, right? You can actually move the plane and collect light in sections, right? This essentially um, is like chopping a piece of bread, right, you know, and, um, and taking each slice um, and visualizing each slice um, and then putting all the slices together to see the entire slice of bread, entire loaf of bread, right? Um, and that's what now you can do by taking optical sections, right? So you can take, uh, this is an image of a pollen, and uh, you can see that you can take sections from one end to the other and then put all of it together to create this three-dimensional structure. This A that you are seeing is essentially this pollen uh, that has been imaged in a confocal. And you can create a three-dimensional uh, you know, image of uh, the cell or whatever object that you're visualizing using a confocal microscope in a way that would not have been possible otherwise. This, in my opinion, was a real game changer in microscopy. Okay, and um, you know, along with the kind of change in visualization that those early microscopes produced, confocal changed how we view things. Okay, it allowed us to see things, and this is a movie that's not playing because I have a PDF file here. But you are essentially looking at a cell that's in a gel. Okay, and it's made a small protrusion, and you can visualize the cell uh, not only uh, you know as a cross section uh, and then put it together, but you are also able to see this in time, which means it will do section, 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 go to the bottom, go back section, section, section. And every, suppose it takes uh, two seconds for it to take sections from top to bottom and go back up. You know, you have a three-dimensional image that's one or two seconds apart. 
and now you can put a movie together right of these and play them back to back and see things that are changing inside the cell accordingly right so so you're also able to visualize things that are moving inside the cell as well you're also able to do things like you know this is a protein that's on the membrane of the cell okay and and that box that you are seeing seeing is a box that we go and bleach there is something called photo bleaching which is essentially you shine light and you completely remove the fluorescence in there right inside that box and then you watch the rest of the proteins come and fill that area right and and this allows you to now watch the rate at which things are moving inside the cell so all this is now possible because of uh, you know confocal microscopy there are more advanced versions and i'm not going to get into that in the interest of time and also this is something that you can go read um, on your own um, there is something called a spinning disc confocal microscope which does one better than the existing confocal microscope um, and uh, there is there are now new uh, microscopy systems called uh, stead um, and there is a system called storm uh, which also affects uh, you know the resolution of the image and allows you to now uh, you know resolve things better right so if you have a fluorescent strand that looks like this you know the quality of that uh, image can be improved dramatically by storm microscopy right so these are similar images which are taken with a um, regular confocal microscope and with the super resolution uh, imaging microscope right what i will also say a little bit about is along with the development in tools to visualize okay there are algorithms that are written to process the image okay that means these are mathematical algorithms that are written to essentially clean up the image but do it uh, you know keeping in mind what the fluorescence is like where exactly the fluorescence is what is the region of say bleed through in the fluorescence if this is where the light source is but when you record the image you you are seeing fluorescence in this neighboring region how do i determine that this is the specific light source and remove all of this and let you see only this much okay this can be done mathematically now right and there is a very very powerful beautiful tool called deconvolution which is nothing but a mathematical algorithm that was written to clean up images right so you can take a confocal image and then you can deconvolute it which means you are not actually changing the how you record the image you are only cleaning up the image as a post processing right after you have recorded the image uh, you are processing it in such a way that you can now see things that would have been difficult to see otherwise okay uh, we in the lab for example use a deconvolution software that's made by this um, uh, you know company from holland called huygens um, and it's an incredibly powerful tool right it allows us to shoot uh, deconvoluted images such as this this is actually a cell in which the golgi has undergone you know restructuring and it's filled up the entire cell right um, and this is an image which is a confocal image so we've taken sections and then we have deconvoluted it using such an algorithm to get this clarity in the architecture in a way that uh, you know we would not have had otherwise okay so so we can we can do stuff like this in uh, in this system in a way that would not be possible otherwise so that's where i will stop okay 